good morning. Welcome to the Sacred Grace. My name is Maggie. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are glad that you are with us this morning. If you're new here, you might not know that we um, were a parish church, and that means that we take social and spiritual responsibility for the city of Englewood, for the neighbors in homes and out of them around us, for the city government, for the businesses that run around in this city. We care about them, we pray for them, we frequent them. We love our city because God loves our city and every single person in it. We, maybe you've noticed this, but we switched up some of our liturgy. So if you're new with us, you won't see any difference. But if you've been with us for a little while, you'll notice a couple of shifts and changes. Communion is at the beginning of our service now partially to let our kids' classes and kids' teachers be part of it with us, but also because we want to view communion as the lens through which we see everything else in our service. The love of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, is why we do everything that we do. And so by doing communion right at the beginning, we kind of put that at the forefront. And everything else we do the rest of the morning is because of that. At the beginning of our gatherings, we like to take a moment just to pause and to breathe. And part of that is because on Sundays for our Sunday gatherings, we like to refocus together, recenter. And as a church, that is one of our goals, to be with each other, to grow and learn with one another. Another goal for us is to send you out. We want to be people who engage in the city, in the people around us. But here at the very beginning, we're going to take a moment to pause and to breathe together, and to focus our intention for this morning. We do that by pondering and meditating on a couple of questions. So I'll read those for you this morning. There will be some time right afterwards to think about them, pray about them. Take a moment now as the band plays to set your intention and focus this morning. What led you here? Was it an invitation from a friend, a search you did online, a gut feeling? What led you here? What did you bring with you? Are you carrying guilt or shame or fear or pain? Are you carrying joy or hope or contentment or peace? What did you bring with you? What is on your mind or heart? Name a distraction at home or at work or in your neighborhood that is keeping you from being fully present this morning. What is on your mind or heart? And finally, What do you want? What do you desire for this morning? For yourself, for our church, for our city? What do you want? Please stay with us as we sing.
Just give me Jesus. And when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, give. When we gather for worship, we gather for a meal of sorts. Um, this is kind of like a theoretical version of it when we consume information or ideas or consume more of God's presence, however you want to look at it. But we also want to start our experience together with the consumption of food and drink to remind us that we're gathered for a meal and that you are invited to the table and you are included at that meal. And that's why we begin with communion, to remind ourselves that Jesus invites us into the story, invites us into the experience with no prerequisite or adjustment or change. Nobody's going to ask you to leave this place and go fix something or sort something out so that you can come back in and experience communion with us. You're accepted here just as you are. Uh, there's a station in the back where some of our elders will be with communion elements, and then Maggie and I will be up front here with these communion elements. You're welcome to go to the back or to the front to receive bread and wine. And if you would just take those elements back to your seat, and we'll take communion all together once everybody's been served.
Just give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. You can have. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he poured wine in a glass, and he passed these things around to his friends at the table. He said, this is my body for you, and this is my blood for you. And in doing so, he reminded them about a repair that was about to take place, and in many ways had already begun. Uh, Repairing a broken relationship between God and humanity, and really reinstituting a new one, or creating something else that hadn't really existed in the past. He talked about a lot of things that evening, but one of the things he said was, I'm, I'm establishing a new covenant, which was to say in that time, I'm establishing a new relationship between God and humanity. And he became in that moment this great redeemer, this great repairer, this great bridge between uh, over a chasm between two things. And the elements that you hold in your hand right now are a representation of that. And over the years, over the decades, over the millennia, we have made a tremendous amount of of complex observations about this moment. But don't miss the simplicity of the elements that are in your hands right now. Don't miss the fact that this simply means this. God loves you and has invited you into his story. That's what these elements are a reminder of. God loves you and has invited you into his story. Would you stand with me? Consider the bread in your hand and join me in this prayer. Despite our shortcomings, you came for us. Despite our sin, You died for us. In light of your love, you saved us. We cling to the promise of the resurrection. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Take and eat and remember that he is alive. And now the cup. Raise your glasses if for a toast and join me in this prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let us drink in courageous celebration. You may place your glass under your seat and continue standing while we sing this next song. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load again. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go.
Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load again. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load again. No longer. No longer am I held by the yoke of this world. I come up under the yoke of Jesus. His yoke is easy, his burden is so light. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load again. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load again. No longer am I held. Of this world, come up under the yoke of Jesus. This yoke is easy, this burden is so light. This burden is so light. in my load, you're lifting my No. 
deserve it Still you give yourself away And hold the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie, you won't tear down. Coming after me. Oh, there's no shadow. This is a reading from the Psalms. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. 
He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is a message from the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus used to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. Let me go ahead and be seated. Kids are dismissed to your classes. Sometimes I'm asked uh, why we maintain a consistent liturgy from week to week and why we say some of the same prayers and sing some of the same songs. And um, The theory all along has been that as we continue to do that with some sort of repetition, it starts to take root in our hearts and it becomes... Uh, like we, we can engage it with muscle memory. It's like we can remember it and we can do it kind of off the cuff and offhand. And so whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that's happening, we have a response to it. Um, I was reminded of this just now as my son Lucas isn't feeling uh, 100% at the moment and um, was, I think, almost asleep on my shoulder and was still singing the doxology like because he knows it, you know, because he's been around it enough. Um when um, when I woke up this morning and learned about the gun violence in Colorado Springs taking the lives of five people and injuring 18, my response was, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. When our hearts break and we don't know what to say or what to do, a liturgy, whether it's a corporate liturgy that we all practice together or one that we hold personally, is a kind of our fallback. Whether you're like Lucas and just feeling out of it today, sick and tired and whatever, you could still sing these words and say these things. And I don't know what to say when shootings happen. I've never really known. I mean, I've, I'm supposed to know, I think, because I'm a pastor and I'm, it's my job to know, but I never really know. And so we've created these liturgies to give us something to say and something to participate in that responds to the pain and we have our prayers to the people that will come after this homily, and you'll have an opportunity to, um, to engage with those things in that way as well. And we hope that that remains a gift to you, not just for here, but for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Not just when you're with each other, but when you're alone and by yourself. Um, having the opportunity to engage these things, I think, is important. That's not how I intended to start our the homily today. I just wanted to share some of that with you in case you're new and you're wondering why we do some of the things that we do. Uh, we're currently in a series right now, a very short series that's cluing you into some of the methodology that we've chosen as a church as we um, continue to align our lives and hearts with the way of Jesus. 
And we've had uh, our first one, Maggie, preached about uh, what it means and what it looks like for us to move toward God, what that worship and prayer actually accomplishes and how we pursue that in our life. And last week, um, one of our elders, Carol, did a beautiful job talking about what it looks like for us to move in towards each other in a way that b- creates meaningful connection and meaningful community, even to the point of sacrifice where we're willing to be there for each other through thick and thin. And today, my responsibility is to talk about how we are to move out towards our community. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about and I love a lot, and it's really hard for me to make my words concise and few in this, so I'll do the very best that I can. But know that this is the tip of the iceberg, and there's so much more to say on this. And so as you have questions or thoughts or ideas, I want to have more dialogue with you on this. Uh, This last week, I I came across an announcement uh, from a large church here in the U.S. There's no use in trying to figure out which one it is. It doesn't really matter. It's not the point. Uh, that, That we'll be planting a church or a campus or something. I don't really know what terms people use anymore. But starting a new thing could attach to them in New York City. And in this announcement, they said of New York City uh, that, that it had, quote, become a demonic stronghold seeping the cesspool of immorality into society and exporting it around the globe. They said this was true actually of a lot of places, not just New York City, and that they were going to, quote, target these cities as well in planting churches to turn this trend around. Now, some of you have like a visceral, visceral reaction to this kind of, right? And that's okay. That's a very normal thing to be like, well, those are mean things to say about other people because they are, you know? It's like one of the first things we learn is like, you don't call people cesspools or whatever. Um, <laughs> and there was a tremendous amount of backlash to this statement online and uh, from, <laughs> if you can believe it, from New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> they were offended uh, naturally. Uh, by this statement, and they've changed the statement, so you, can't, you won't be able to find the statement as it is online anymore. It's different, but the sentiment is the same. The sentiment remains the same, and the sentiment is this. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, and we have the antidote. We have the antidote. We have the, the cipher or the serum or the whatever it is, the thing that can turn this world around, that can turn culture around, that can turn society around, and if it wasn't for the church, the physical manifestation and expression of the gospel, the church, then the world would just continue to ruin itself over and over and over again. And I understand the sentiment, and I understand why they use some of these words, and I understand why they may have said some of these things, even even the more mild version, and it's because it works. It's effective. It's just like church planting 101. You have to identify the need and communicate the need, And then you have to meet that need. But what really ends up happening in order to expedite the process is you you identify the need, you embellish the need, and then you don't just meet the need, but you become the sole and only possible entity that can meet that need. It's effective. And I've confessed to you that it was very tempting to use some of this language when we started our church seven years ago because I know how effective it is. There's money in these words, literally. You can can raise money by calling a city a cesspool of immorality. You can raise money, and you can get people on board with that. It's effective. You can expedite the process, and you can get a lot of work done right on the front end if you can use this sort of language. But there was something that stopped us from doing that. There was was this, this text in the Old Testament that we couldn't shake at the beginning, and to this day, we haven't been able to shake. It's this text that, if there was ever a cheat code in the Bible, like, this is it. And, and I know that, like, I mean, I haven't played a video game in, like, 10 years, but, you know, there used to be. I don't even know if this is still the case. You used to be able to hit, like, A, A, B, B, up, down, left, right, and, like, some, your guy would do something cool, right? I have, no idea, I have no idea if that exists in video games anymore. Most of the time in the, in the Bible, we've looked for cheat codes for prosperity or cheat codes for salvation or cheat codes for, like, healthier relationships or cheat codes for like saving my marriage or cheat codes for this and that, right? These are the things that we're looking for when we're reading through the Bible. The only one that I found is this one, and it seems to be a cheat code for surviving exile. And it's hard sometimes for us to apply it to our modern era, but this, it seems to be, this is how you survive slavery. This is how you survive exile. This is how you survive being captive to a culture or an audience that it feels dissimilar from what you're used to. 
This is the only one that I've found. And I want to give you a little bit of backdrop before we get into the actual text. Uh, in a minute, I'll read from Jeremiah chapter 29. Most evangelical Christians are familiar with particularly verse 11, which uh, says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, uh, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And we've, we've co-opted that in sort of American evangelicalism and said, he's talking about us. This is great news. God is going to prosper us, not harm us. This is great. But there's actually some really, really important stuff that comes before that. So we're not even going to get to 11 today. You seem to probably know it and, you know, probably have an opinion about it. So we're going to spend some time in some other ones. But I want to give you a little bit of cultural context and backdrop before we do this. A couple weeks ago, we were in the book of Amos for about six weeks. And one of the things that kept coming up over and over and over again in Amos was God saying, I'm going to send you into exile. I'm going to send you into exile. But paired right alongside that, it became very clear that God was saying to at least some of the people that he was talking to, you're going to cease to exist. And it sounded like God is going to violently eradicate the earth with the, of these people. But in reality, what God was saying, not so violently and not at his hand, but at the hands of another nation, God was going to disperse his people and they would slowly and gradually cease to exist. And that is to say their culture was to cease to exist. So by way of reminder, there were two kingdoms. At the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had ten tribes. The southern kingdom had two tribes. And those two kingdoms did go into exile, and they went into exile at different times for different reasons. Now, when a larger, more powerful nation at that time would take captive another nation, it, wasn't as, it was barbaric, but it wasn't as barbaric as we think of it as. It was very normal, actually. In fact, it wouldn't have been very newsworthy. It wouldn't have like hit the news cycles in the ancient Near East that one nation had ca- taken captive of another nation. It was sort of obvious. If you're a larger, more powerful nation, you would take captive a smaller, weaker nation. It's what you would do. It's odd in our modern era to think of it that way, and it's why we've reacted the way we've had bristled so much to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, because it is something that feels very out of place for our modern era. But essentially, in the ancient Near East in this time, it was very common for a large, wealthy, powerful nation to take advantage of and therefore take captive a smaller, weaker nation. And when they would do this, they would take the people of that nation that they had taken captive of and they would disperse them throughout their new, larger nation, and they would start to lose their identity slowly over time. Imagine some of the norms and the values that you hold to. Those are probably encased or housed within your family unit. They're housed among friends, maybe a group of neighbors, or uh, maybe, um, maybe a group of other moms, or maybe a group of other teachers, or maybe a, a group of coworkers. these ideals that you hold on to. Now imagine if you were dispersed, and there was only like one other person that was like you, or maybe none, and you weren't able to really be in touch with all the other people who believed the same thing that you did. And then you were told you really can't practice the things that you love. You really can't practice the things that you believe in. You have to practice these new things. Well, over time, in many cases, just the span of a generation, your culture ceases to exist. This is what happened with the 10 northern tribes of Israel. They're referred to as the lost tribes, and they were taken by the Assyrians, and they basically ceased to exist. They're referred to as the diaspora. They're just sort of everywhere. They became the Samaritan people. They were referred to at that time, and even not long after that, as half-breeds. They were not really fully, completely Jews in the minds of the people in that area at that time. But something else happens with the nation of Judah, the southern nation. And it's because they heard these words from the prophet Jeremiah, and they were able to apply this wisdom from God. And the reason why the nation of Judah didn't cease to exist, and in fact, they were able to be repatriated, reinstituted, and repaired to their original land after 70 years. The reason why is because they paid attention to these words from Jeremiah. And I think these these words give us something to think about when it comes to engaging the culture around us, when it comes to engaging our community around us, when it comes to moving out towards our neighbor, and not just living within the echo chamber that's very comfortable uh, in our table group or our small group or our church experience or whatever it is. This is what spurs us on to go out. God says this, starting in verse 4, This is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city 
which, uh, to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Seek the prosperity of the place that you call home. Do not fight and resist against it, and do not assimilate to become exactly like it. We around here refer to this as living a parish life or uh, a par- operating under a parish mindset. And we borrow that word from kind of a bygone area, era when churches were um, maybe established in a town. And you didn't choose a church based on your preferences or like whether or not the music was what you liked or whether or not the pastor said funny things or whatever. You didn't church- choose your church that way. You, choose a chur- you chose a church based on its proximity to where you lived. Because there weren't, there weren't automobiles to just sort of take you wherever. There weren't live streams where you could like watch a church in Atlanta when you were kind of feeling that more than you were feeling your other whatever, right? That, that was a different era. And oftentimes those churches referred to as parishes and the pastors, the priests of those, pla- of those, um, uh, of those entities or those, uh, those organizations would think of the entire town as their parish, their responsibility. And the people in that church would also think of the church as their parish, their, their responsibility. And that's the term that we've used to describe our church as well. This parish mindset is one that threads the needle between assimilation and resistance. It's somewhere in between. And when, when we're living in, in a community that doesn't totally align with our ideals and values, and my guess is that at some point in time, as you've lived, uh, lived your life, in, whether it's in your workplace or in your neighborhood or wherever it is that you, you, find, um, uh, you find you spend most of your time, at some point in time, one of your ideals or values as a Christian has sort of come in conflict with an ideal or a value of the people that you're working with or the people that you live near or the people that you spend time with. It's likely. And at that moment, it feels as though you have two choices, and I'm here to tell you that you have the third. It feels as though you have two choices. One is to say, you know what, my, I, my thought, my conviction, my, um, my opinion on this actually doesn't matter at all. And I'm just going to adopt and embrace whatever other people around me are saying they value. Okay, this is the assimilation that the northern kingdom of Israel um, uh, sort of gave, gave into when they were taken captive by Assyria and they ceased to exist. The other option, the pendulum kind of swings the other way, and you can go the resistance route, and you can be like, you know what, that is a cesspool of immorality, that thing that you think, and I am opposed to that, and I am resistant to that. We're now on different sides of that issue. It's now you versus me. I reject that outright, wholesale rejection of the thing that that person said or believes or thinks. It feels like those are our options. Both of those lead to non-existence. Both of those lead, lead to us dying in some way. One, in, in a way, because we just become completely assimilated to the culture around us. The other, because we become so opposed to and wholesale rejecting the community around us that we never get to engage in it and be connected to it which is really what God has called us to do, to be connected to our community, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And you don't get to do that when you reject them. You don't get to love your neighbor when you reject them outright. You also don't really love them genuinely when you pretend like you don't have any thoughts or opinions or convictions on things. That's not real love. It's not genuine, at least. There's a third way. And I believe that the dead center of, the, of, of that needle between assimila- assimilation and resistance is living a parish life. It's living a life where we bring the gospel to bear on a community, the gospel being the peace of God brought to bear on a community, on real people in a real place, and doing so with the patience that is given to us in Jeremiah chapter 29. Put down roots, build houses, start families, stay connected, Continue to maintain your cultural practice, your cultural, cultural ideologies, your cultural convictions. Those are beautiful things. Don't give up on those things. But also, at the same time, don't shove those things down the throats of other people. Find a way to continue to maintain your community that allows you to maintain your convictions while simultaneously engaging the community around you. Fight for, pray for, move towards the prosperity of the place that you're in. 
one of the ways that this has played out in our church in a way that um, I will continue to brag about for all of time. And not because we did it, but because God continues to do it through us. And so I feel comfortable bragging about it. What God has done through the Inglewood Christmas store is a great example of this working itself out. When we start right at the exact same time we started our church seven years ago, I knocked on the door of Bishop Elementary School. I probably just walked in. I feel like that's what the like school security situation for that old building was not the best. And I'm pretty sure I just walked in. And I said, I'd like to speak with the principal. And they said, why? And I said, well, I want to talk to him about how we can serve in the community. And I met with the principal, and she said, you know, our school is really struggling. At that time, they were in a turnaround status, and it, they weren't sure if the state was going to shut them down or, or kind of take over. They didn't know what was going to happen next. But they were in a turnaround status, and they were really struggling. And she said, you know, there's this church that comes from Castle Rock, and they come up here every December, and they put on this store for a handful of our families. And our families really need it. They're really struggling, and they really need it. Maybe you guys could help us with that. And I said, okay, let's jump in. And what we decided to do from the very beginning, we've continued to do, is to show up consistently and to shut up. We try to show up and shut up. And I know that that's really abrupt, and you're like, wait, that's mean. You can't say shut up. We don't say it in our house either, so it's okay. Um, uh, But the kids are all in their class, so it's fine. Um, (laughs) We'd show up and just watch and listen. And over time, we built credibility with not not just that school, but the entire district. Not just with the teachers, but with the principals. Not just with the principals, but the superintendent and the school board and the parents and the families. And now, not just our church, but the entire idea of the Inglewood Christmas store has become something of a trusted institution in our city. This year we'll serve 250 families. And when we first started, it was like 20, 25. And it was run by a church that would like come in, kind of like helicopter in, like, you know, sat down, they would do a bunch of good work, and then they would kind of go back to where they were. And over time, they have beautifully transitioned us into a position of leadership. They have so humbly and genuinely given, like, just over time, given us more and more leadership until we were the ones who got the chance to lead this thing. And it's taken years and years and years. That parish life, that parish mindset, threading the needle between assimilation and rejection, usually takes quite a bit of time It takes quite a bit of patience. It oftentimes takes a lot of showing up and shutting up and just watching for where God is on the move and then joining in on that thing. You see, when we, when we, whether it's your neighborhood or your place of work or or whatever it is you want to apply this to, when we see that place as a cesspool of seeping immorality, right, when we think of it that way, we're assuming that God is not at work there. And then if it weren't for us, God would not be at work there. Good thing we showed up, right? Do you see that become? I mean, the arrogance that 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 can produce is fast. It's no, it's not a far. It's not a big jump from that's a terrible place to it's a good thing I showed up. But when you can see the beauty in a place, your neighborhood, your neighbors, your place of work, your the that bar you go to, that restaurant you go to. Um, that person that you end up walking by pretty regularly because you happen to have the same kind of like commute pattern, whatever it is, when you can start to see the beauty, the manifestation of God's presence and God's likeness in the people and the places where you, where you live, work, and play, when you can start to see that, your, your imagination for how to join in will come alive. And you'll have this opportunity to take spiritual and social responsibility for wherever it is that you are that doesn't require you to give up on the things that you're convicted about, and it doesn't require you to outright reject the things that you are told and you experience from other people. There's a third way. There's a middle way, and we believe it's this parish life where we, benef- we, we value the beauty and the benefits of any community that we're in, and then we continue to listen and pray and act on the things that God is already doing. I firmly believe that the Inglewood Christmas store is something that God was doing before we even showed up. Literally, that was happening. But the the work that that store has done in the lives of the people in this community preceded us. And we're just joining in. We're just joining in. The gospel is the peace of God brought to bear on real people in a real place. And if we are agents of that gospel then we will bring the peace of God to bear on real people and in real places. 
For you, it might be joining in on the Christmas story just to kind of see this thing unfold, to see the work of God in the lives of the families in our schools. It could be one of many other things, and we do have a list of different partnerships we have in the community, um, and we'd love to connect you with the people who are helping make those things happen. Maybe for you, it's poverty alleviation. Maybe for you, it's education. Maybe for you, it's local government. Maybe for you, it's, it's just getting to know your literal neighbors and doing things that care for those people who live next to you. My hope is that you'll find a way after this service today to connect with one thing that's happening in the community, to move towards it, not in a way that rejects it, not in a way that you become completely a part of it, but in a way that brings the peace of God to bear on that people in that place. That's my hope. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for um, the gift that your word has been to us over the years. Um, as perplexing as, and complex as the Bible can be, we're so grateful that it continues to give us these reminders of the work that you're doing in and through us. Thank you for that, God. Thank you for this community, both this immediate community here in our church, but also the community outside of us that we are going out to. We pray, God, that we would be a blessing to everyone that we encounter. Teach us to bring your peace with us wherever we go and to bring that peace to bear on the people that we see at work and at home, at school, whatever it may be. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this point in our service, we'd like to provide an opportunity for reflection and prayer. No matter where you are in your faith journey, consider this a practice for rest and meditation. Lord, we approach you with humility and reverence this morning. Some of us are weary, some of us willing, others are apathetic or aimless. We pray that our time together today re would rejuvenate our faith, awaken our souls, and guide us into the week with confidence and courage. Lord, hear our prayers. We'd like to offer you some time at this point in the service to reflect on the homily, scripture, and, and songs. Did something stand out to you? Is there something you would like to learn more about? Are there any questions that you need to follow up on? Spend a moment now as the band plays to pause and reflect. This month, we join our voices with indigenous peoples in the Americas to celebrate their deeply rooted and historic cultural values and to lament the theft and violence they have faced throughout our history as a nation. We pray that we would learn from the spiritual and relation, relational depth of indigenous cultures and look for opportunities to repair and restore the brokenness that so many have caused before us. Lord, hear our prayers. We lift up the place we call home, our parish, the city of Inglewood. We pray for Inglewood schools and school board. We lift up our superintendent, Wendy Rubin, the members of the school board, as well as the principals, teachers, and staff of Inglewood schools. We pray for discernment as they face constant challenges in their work, and we pray that they would work as a team to put students first at every turn. In the midst of the gravity of responsibility, may they experience the levity of your grace. We lift up the branches of government that lead at the national and state levels. We pray for our President Joe Biden, our Vice President Kamala Harris, and our Governor Jared Polis. May they lead with integrity and humility. We pray for our state and national lawmakers. May they legislate with grace and courage. We pray for the courts at every level. May they do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. In the midst of the gravity of responsibility, May they experience the levity of your grace. We pray, Lord, over everything we have carried here with us today. For those of us who are experiencing hardship and for those who are far from you. For those of us grieving personal loss, professional loss, or spiritual loss. We specifically lament the shooting that took the lives 
of five people at an LGBTQ club in Colorado Springs last night, and we deeply grieve violence of any kind towards this community. Lord, be with the family and friends of those five. Comfort the 18 others who were injured. As we say the names of the things we lament, may we find healing and hope of the resurrection. The world is not as it should be. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, we confess to you that we and our ancestors before us have sinned against you, our neighbor, our friends, our family, strangers, and ourselves by doing the wrong thing and by leaving the right thing undone. We place these things in your ready and capable hands and receive the liberation of forgiveness in, the, in their stead. Take a moment to confess your sin, considering if there is anyone you should bring into that confession with you this week. We confess our sin to you. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We celebrate, Lord, the many gifts you have given to us. As we sing this song, may we, may we be reminded of the many blessings you have given us. So glad you joined us today. Thank you for being a part of this with us this morning. I want to let you know about a couple of things that are coming up, and then we'll close our service with the generosity prayer in just a minute. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Inglewood Christmas store is fast approaching. A lot of people think Christmas, and they're like, yeah, December 25th, I have lots of time. The Christmas store is on December.